Hey, it's Memorial Day weekend, and we would be remiss if we did not recognize the men and women in our church who have served in the armed forces. And so I just would like to do that now. If you served in the armed forces, would you please stand and let us see where you are all across the auditorium? Would you stand, please? What an honor. What an honor. Honor. Wow. Y'all, it's awesome. God bless you. God bless you. You can be seated. Let me tell you what happened to me yesterday. It was one of the highest honors I have ever had. Doug, I haven't even told you this. Yesterday I did a wedding um, in Lilburn. And so a Friday night we went to rehearsal and we found out that the grandfather of the groom was one of the original Tuskegee Airmen. And so I got to meet him. And Friday night we talked just a little while, and then Saturday at the wedding we talked a lot. Sandra, do you have the picture of, um, there he is. His name is Colonel Green, um, Paul Green. You can look him up. He was one of the original, he's 90 years old. He has the most booming voice. You, you cannot imagine, when I say booming, it is melodic, it is beautiful. It is, he kept saying, your voice is so fantastic, and it's like, you're 90 years old. Your voice is way better than my voice. Like, I was just, I mean, I was just, I was just in love with this man. He entered the military, Warren, he entered the military. He was raised in an orphanage in Ohio. But the orphanage taught values that need to be taught today. The orphanage taught that it's all about self-reliance, getting out there and working and being um, responsible, being a responsible person. And so he learns these things he learns to be proud of his country. When he gets out, he has an aptitude toward electronics. Then Tuskegee opens the doors for African Americans to become pilots for the first time. And he was part of the first class. And then he becomes a pilot. And in 1943, he begins flying missions out of Italy, where he is one of the most decorated war heroes in World War II. I'm sitting there and I'm thinking, I'm 50 years old, I haven't done anything with my life. I've done nothing. I've, I, it's like, I just was soaking up every word. When he gets out, he uh, ended up staying in, I guess, until retirement age. He ended up um, being the uh, supreme commander of several uh, bases and uh, ended up getting an honorary doctor's degree from Tuskegee, which I thought was very wonderful. And then President Bush gave him the Congressional Medal of Honor. And then he was uh, one of the few people invited to sit on the stage when President Obama was inaugurated uh, as President of the United States. And he now lives in Southern California, which, oh, by the way, I'm going to have to be there this next week. And he said, would you and your wife please come to our house and just spend some time with us? And it's like, oh, yes, we will. <laughs> and uh, he kept saying to me, he kept saying, you must have robbed the cradle with your wife. She is so beautiful. <laughs> And it's like, yeah, something like that. It was, uh, yeah, maybe. But anyway, he was so wonderful, and he loves God. He told us, he said, we go to a Baptist church, but we are, we are interdenominational. I said, we're interdenominational too, but I, my, my background is Baptist. That's wonderful. And he said, we are, we are tithers, and he said, we put our trust in the Lord. And it's like, I love you. I love you. I love you. He is a beautiful man. So anyway... For me, that was one of the highlights. Warren, that was one of the highlights of uh, the last year for me, maybe the last five years for me. That was just a joy. And I think I'm going to interview him when I'm down there. I think I'm going to figure out a way to interview him on video and uh, bring it back and just let you meet him and hear him because he is something. And his wife is something, too. They've been married 67 years, and uh, she's beautiful. And uh, anyway, pretty, pretty awesome pretty awesome. Well, I titled the message today, There's a Train a-Coming, and uh, you'll get what I'm talking about in just a few minutes. I have a friend. He's 63 years old, and he has cancer in his prostate. In fact, he did. They took his prostate out. He's gone through tough surgery. He's been on chemo now for a while, and the doctor told him last week he had one to five years to live. Last week, in this place, I did a funeral service for a 56-year-old woman. She had some health concerns, but no one was expecting while she was in the hospital she would die, but she did. 
Two weeks ago, I did a funeral. A co-worker of Ethan's died. She was healthy. She was beautiful. She worked out every day. She was 27 years old. She was the picture of perfect health until an infection got in her blood, causing her to go into toxic shock syndrome. And her parents were called in the middle of the night saying they had no idea their daughter, their daughter and their granddaughter are just living in Atlanta. They live in Nashville. They received a call middle of the night. You need to get to the hospital now. They didn't know she had even felt bad. They rushed from Nashville. By the time they got here, she was in a coma, and a few hours later, she died. This week, I was thinking about the first death at the Village Church. The first death we went through as a church family. It was 20 years ago. There was a beautiful girl in our church named Becky. She had been away from the Lord. She had kind of rebelled against her parents and rebelled against just the, the whole life that she had been brought up in and, and had kind of gotten off the track. But she came to, and, and then she had tried to get back on track, but she went to a church and she felt some judgment. Uh, maybe it's just being a young girl. I don't know what it was, but she was 19 and she felt some of her peers looking down their nose at her and she just felt like she was an outcast because she had been in some bad places. So she comes to our church and we are, we are clueless, right? We're just in a little shopping center. We're just getting started. And we did our first drama ever that Sunday. And the drama happened to be about a young person um, who had gotten off track and how in some churches they are met maybe with uh, not open arms but maybe felt less than. And something clicked with this girl and her whole life changed. And she gave her heart to Jesus and her family was reconciled and she would come every Sunday and she was so beautiful. Her countenance was beautiful and her, just a gorgeous young 19 year old girl. And I remember being at one of the boys' ball games. I don't remember which one it was, but they were playing in a ball game in Forest Park, and I got a text. Y'all remember text, 911, and I went to the concession stand, and I called to see what was going on and found out that uh, she had been in an automobile accident, and she was, had been rushed to the hospital, and it looked bad. And I rushed to the hospital, and I got there about the same time the family got there and was asked to go into the room with them when they said that Becky had died. I'm not saying any of these things to depress you at all because you know this. One day, each of us are going to die. We may be 90, like the colonel, 95, 100. We may be 60. We may be 40. It happens to people in the teens, tragically. And it's something most of us prefer not to talk about, but we know it's a reality we all will face. The Bible says it rather bluntly. In fact, James chapter 4 says it like this. Why, you do not even know what will happen tomorrow. What is your life? You are a mist. Just, psst. You're a mist that appears for a little while and then it vanishes. The psalmist said it like this. Seventy years are given to us. Some may even reach 80, but even the best of these years are filled with pain and trouble, and soon they disappear, and we are gone. Now, I think I've always been a little bit of a deep thinker. I think even as a kid, I don't know, maybe other people are this way. I was just real, I thought about death. Once death kind of became a part of my thought, I kind of thought about it a lot. And I would think, one day it's over. I mean, over. And I just used to, couldn't get my, my mind around that. Over. Do you think about it much? Boy, I did. Either I'll speak at your funeral, or you will maybe attend mine. But I think about that. Billy and I, we go back, we went to school together. I know my buddies that go back 30, 40 years, I'll either stand at their graveside or they'll stand at mine. But we're all going to die. We can't cheat death. In the Middle East, there's a fable. This is just a made-up story, but it's a fable that's told of a Baghdad merchant who sent his servant to the marketplace to run an errand. When the servant had completed his assignment, he was about to leave the marketplace, but he turned the corner and unexpectedly he ran into Lady Death. 
The look on her face so frightened him that he left the marketplace and he hurried home and he told his master what had happened and he requested the fastest horse so he could get as far away from Lady Death as possible, a horse that would take him all the way to Samara before nightfall. The master said, sure, you can go. Later that same afternoon, the merchant himself went to the marketplace and he too saw Lady Death. And he said, Lady Death, why did you scare my servant this morning? And Lady Death Death said, I didn't intend to startle your servant. It was I who was startled. I was surprised to see your servant this morning in Baghdad because I have an appointment with him tonight in Samara. Like Lady Death will be where Lady Death is going to be and will meet you when it's your time to go. Well, we have been doing this series on questions that you have. Things that I hear every week, I hear people say, well, what about, I wonder about this, or I was thinking about this, or does the Bible say anything about this? And we try to look at some different things, and we're going to continue the, the series through much of the summer. But with that Memorial Day weekend, when we honor men and women who have given their lives for our country, I thought, why don't we just take a minute, not, not to scare anybody, because my purpose is not to scare anybody or to be manipulative. Please understand, the farthest thing from my mind is to try to manipulate anybody, But I want to talk about something that's real, and that's death. We can't avoid the subject. It will happen for each of us. So are there some things the Bible teaches us about death? There are. So with pen in hand, would you kind of hang with me for three or four thoughts? Simple thoughts, yet they will help you if you will understand them. And then at the end, that card that I gave you, it's going to become important, so don't forget where that is, all right? All right, pen in hand, write this down. What does the Bible tell me about death? Well, the first thing that I needed to know for me was this. While my body will one day die, I was created to live forever. Write that down. While my body will one day die, I was created by God to live forever. The Old Testament says that and the New Testament says that. We were created for eternity. That's another way to say it. We were created for eternity. So if you were thinking about it, if your life kind of starts, this is your life. You were created for eternity, which is forever in that direction, as far as you can imagine, and then keep going forever and ever and ever. Your time on earth, your time on earth is but an inch in this journey. You understand? You are here. You have eternity that way. Your time on earth is just this, but you were created for that forever. Okay? You have to get that picture in your mind. You were created for that. This is what the Bible says in Ecclesiastes chapter 3. He, God, has also set eternity in the hearts of men, yet they cannot fathom what God has done from beginning to end. The Bible says God has placed this thought in us We are going to live forever. You see this in the New Testament. Jesus would tell parables and he would talk about life beyond this life. And let me me make sure you understand this. The Old Testament wasn't terribly clear about what that life would be like. The New Testament gives a lot more of what that would be like. The Old Testament was, uh, there was some thought of Abraham's bosom, but it wasn't super clear. There was some thought when David said, about a dead child, he cannot come to me, but I will one day go to him. Those kind of things were said, but it wasn't clearly defined. There was a lot of uh, kind of speculation about what it meant. And then Jesus comes and he gives us much more detail. For example, Jesus tells a story and he says there was a rich man dressed in the finest of the fine. I mean, he had money galore. He'd, he'd live in Buckhead if he was Atlanta. He's a Buckhead guy. He's got a big mansion in Buckhead. He eats the finest foods. He wears the finest clothes. He drives the finest cars, and at the gate to his house, there was a beggar named Lazarus who would have loved just to have eaten the scraps off of the rich man's table. The picture is this rich man doesn't care at all about the the poverty of the poor. He doesn't care. He doesn't care. He's living up here, could care less. And Jesus said, but one day they both die. And Jesus said, the poor man, this was shocking because many people in that day thought if you had wealth, then that meant you were kind of God's favorite. But Jesus said, but the poor man went to Abraham's bosom. He went to the good place. He went to heaven. While the rich man went to hell. And the word used was a place like the garbage dump outside the city of Jerusalem, Gehenna. A nasty place where the garbage was was burned 24-7. Garbage burned, smelly, horrible, worms crawling around. Just a yucky place. Jesus said, the poor man goes here, the rich man goes here. Rich man says, oh my goodness, 
I want to get up there. And they said, sorry, you can't. Well, can somebody please go tell my brothers, I've got five brothers, and I want to make sure that they don't go where I am, that they go somewhere else, only to have the Lord say, even if someone came back from the dead, they probably wouldn't even believe, which is kind of a picture of Jesus coming back from the dead and many people still not believing. But again, the scripture is clear. There are places that we go beyond this life and we live forever. Now, a few observations. This just thoughts I've got, okay? Maybe write this down. God, or, or death, doesn't end a person's existence. You've got to get that in your mind. You maybe want to write that on the side of your paper somewhere. Death doesn't end a person's existence. The doctrine of total annihilation, which is what some religions teach, they believe that when life is over, it's over. That isn't a scriptural idea. Uh, that's, that's a good thought, but the Bible talks about people living forever. Either heaven or hell, that's what the Bible presents. There appears, a second thought or observation, there appears to be two distinct places people go, and there doesn't seem to be any changing of the locale after you died. The idea of purgatory, many of you grew up and you've heard of purgatory, this place you could hang out for a while and then either your friends would pray for you and finally they'd say, okay, you got enough prayers, you can come over into heaven. The idea of purgatory was actually a fundraiser that the church invented in some of its darker days, some of its worst days. I mean, from a marketing point of view, it's a great idea if I could say to people, listen, I know your mother died and I know you loved her very much, but she's, God's kind of holding her here. But if you give us some money for the building fund, we will really pray that God will release her to heaven. That's how, kind of how it worked, all right? That's kind of how it worked. And people like Martin Luther came along and he looked at that teaching and he said, I don't find that in the Bible. That's, that's bizarre. I don't, that's a fundraiser. That doesn't sound at all. That, y'all just made that up which is true, they just made it up. Go to Italy sometimes and go to the Vatican and look at the wealth. It worked. It worked. And, and again, I'm not knocking Catholics because I come from a tradition, we've done some crazy things too in the way of fundraising in my lineage, I guess. But there doesn't seem to be any changing of location. We were created for eternity. You either go one way or the other and there's no changing, okay? Second point I want you to write down is this. The Bible is clear. I can know where I'm going at death. That's huge. That is huge. Write it down. I can know where I am going at death. Now, some of you just recoil at that because it's like, I don't think you can know. Well, the Bible says you can. In fact, one of the great verses in the Bible is 1 John chapter 5. This is a verse that all of you should memorize. John, the apostle of Jesus, said this, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God that you may, what's it say? Know. know that you have eternal life. Would you read that whole verse with me in full voice, please? I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life. So that's a wonderful thing. That's a wonderful thing. I tell you about the kid, me, scared to death about death. I know there's two places we go. I know we can't cross over after we die. We've got to figure this out. The Bible says, I can know where I'm going. Here's some observations. This needs to be a humble thing for us, not a proud thing or arrogant thing for us. Just an observation. I have heard some people who, when they share their confidence in their salvation, they say it arrogantly and in a way that repels people rather than compels people. Does that make sense? I want to make sure that I trust Christ and I'm doing what the Bible says I'm supposed to do, but I want to be humble in the way I say it. It's not, hey, I'm going to heaven, buddy. I know where I'm going. Do you know where you're going? That feels wrong to me. What feels better to me is, you know what the scripture says we can, we can know, and, and, and I want to know, and so I'm trying I'm trusting in what the scripture says and I, I feel confident I feel confident about the decision I've made to follow Christ does that seem different we got to be real careful because y'all we have sent so wrong messages we have sent terrible messages to people about 
what we are like as followers of Christ. I just wish I could, people that go on TV to be the advocates for the faith, I wish we could gag most of them because they're not good advocates. They, they hurt way more than they help and they push people away more than they invite them in. Let me tell you something else, just an observation. I believe what the Bible says. I believe that the Bible says for those who know Jesus Christ, who have trusted their life to Christ, we can know that we have eternal life. We can know that. But I will never, ever postulate on what happens to somebody who doesn't know Jesus Christ. That's not my place. Well, Ray, what about Gandhi? He was a good person, but what about Gandhi? Because you said it's through Jesus, and so what about Gandhi? Because he, he, he believed in principles about Jesus, but he rejected Christianity. So what about Gandhi? I don't answer for God. I, I don't know. I don't know. Can I tell you the best thing in the world to say sometimes? I don't know. Let's practice that. I don't know. Now, you've got to say it like you mean it. Say it again. I don't know. It's okay to say that. I don't know. Again, we run people away when we say, well, I tell you what, I don't care what that Muslim did that was good in his lifetime, blah, 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 blah. If he didn't know Jesus Christ, he is going to hell. He split hell wide open, blah, 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 blah. I don't know. Well, what about, the, what about the person that grew up in India that lived only in the village that they grew up in? It's an Indian young girl. She's 19 years old. She only knew the, the gods of her father. She never knew the God of the Bible. You tell me she's going to hell, Ray? I don't know. I don't know. I just know the Bible says I can know that I have eternal life through Christ. That's all I know. And I know this helped me. It's helped me a lot. And I know that God is good. And I know that God is, you take the word good and then multiply it a billion, zillion times. God is beyond that. He does what's right. He knows what's right. I don't know. It's not my place. I don't know. I don't know. Anyway, that's something else I think is important. Another observation. I do believe the Bible says there's no other name under heaven by which men are saved. If anybody gets to heaven, it is only because of Christ. It is only because of Christ. How that works out, I don't know. I know for me, I put my faith and trust in Christ, and I have a confidence that I'm going to go to heaven. That's the confidence that I have. But I just know whoever's there, whatever, however they got there, they had to first go through Jesus. How God works that out, I don't know. They just have to first go through Jesus, okay? I have no idea how it's applied, and it's okay to say I don't know. Number three, write this down. Because of these things, I don't have to be afraid of death. Because of these ideas, I do not have to be afraid of death. And I have told you my fear concerning death as a young person was very real, and it lasted a long time, and it really kind of locked me up. Let me give you a great scripture. Sometimes you read the scripture in different translations and sometimes they'll just say it in a way that just hits you i love the way this is worded in hebrews chapter 2 hebrews 2 14 and 15 says this because god because god's children are human beings made of flesh and blood jesus also became flesh and blood by being born in human form for only as a human being could he die and only by dying could he break the power of the devil who had the power of death only in this way could he deliver those who have lived all their lives as slaves to the fear of dying. Is that a profound way to say it? I'm going to read it again just because this, this is, is beautiful to me. Because God's children are human beings made of flesh and blood, Jesus also became flesh and blood by being born in human form. For only as a human being could he die. And only by dying could he break the power of the devil who had the power of death. Only in this way could he deliver those who have lived all their lives as slaves to the fear of dying. We don't have to be afraid. We don't have to be afraid. Now, I'll give you a couple of thoughts. Imagine a game you're playing where you know the outcome already. Now, now let, me, let, me, let me set this up a little bit. Billy and I played for a school that was a brand new school. So in 10th grade, we only had 10th graders. In 11th grade, we only had 10th and 11th graders, okay? We were both on the football team. We were both great. He was greater than me, but I was pretty great too, all right? But, that's a little bit of a joke. But anyway, but he really was great. As 10th and 11th graders, we played a full varsity schedule. We played against all these other schools that had uh, 10th, 11th, 12th grade. And we got killed every week. We knew the outcome of the game before we went on the field. We acted like we didn't know. We knew. 
it was going to be 48 to nothing. It was going to be 50 to nothing. It was going to be 38 to nothing. It was going to be 41 to... It was horrible, wasn't it? It was horrible. We got our brains kicked in. So I know what it's like reversely to know the outcome badly before you even begin. But what if you knew going into a game that the end result was going to be victory? Now, some people take this wrong. Some people... It, it, some people say, well, good, then I can do whatever I want to do. I can just live however I want to live. I can, just, I can just drink myself into oblivion. I can do drugs as much as I want to do it. I can sleep with anybody I want to sleep with because, woo, I know the end result. I know where I'm going when it's all over. I don't know if I'd have great confidence in, in, in where you're going, if that's kind of the way you're processing it. You're not supposed to have great confidence if that's the way you're processing it. Okay, hear me. You are not supposed to have great confidence in where you're going if that is the way you are processing it. But for those who have simply trusted their life to Christ, who say, I'm, I'm following him, I want to follow him. Now, you mess up, you're not kicked out of the family. He doesn't kick you out of the family. You know, whoops, I, I, I'm in the ditch. I didn't mean to be in the ditch. Forgive me, God. He pulls us out of the ditch, but we're okay. We know where we're going. We know where we're going. We have that settled. Or when you're in despair because something horrific is happening to you, you're, you're just you're feeling the full weight of, of difficulties. You know what you're able to do? You're able to say, you know what? This endures just for a while. That inch, life is just an inch. But joy for me comes in the morning. It's going to be okay. That, that's why the people could endure persecution and they could endure torment and they can endure all the things they endured because their attitude was, this is really hard, this is really tough, but I can endure this because this is just for a season and I know on the other side of this, there's glory promised to us through Christ. That's why they could say 1 Corinthians 15, 55, O oh, death, where is your victory? O oh, death, where is your sting? Because they knew the other side was going to be glory. For, final thought. Because of these thoughts, I can love life here. I mean love life here. We make a mistake when we preach Christianity as it's only for life insurance after you die. You know what? If it all was not true, if we find out when it's all over that it wasn't true, I would rather live as a follower of Jesus because the life is better. The life is so much better. There's so many good things about being a follower of Jesus. You, you're more at peace with yourself. You're more at peace with people. You're, you're a healthier human being because you have chosen to follow the healthiest human being that's ever walked the planet. So I can enjoy and love life here and look forward to the promotion at the end of this life. Both of those things are possible. I can love life here and serve God and love people, but I can know that one day when I pass through this life to the next, the promotion is going to be wonderful. Y'all, in my life, I have a lot of things I want to do still, a lot of things. There's so many places Jane and I want to go. I don't know if y'all are travelers or not. There's so many places. Warren, I want to get a motorcycle back again and just one time take a long trip with you and Brenda. Just one time. I'm going to get that Harley Davidson back one day. One day. I want, I want badly. I want to go Machu Picchu. I want to go to Peru. I want to, Jane and I want to go to, to Japan and China. I, I want to go to India. I've never been to India. I, I've been a lot of places, but there's a lot of places I've never been before. And I want to go. I want to stay in Buenos Aires. Um, Argentina. I want to go and stay in the downtown district there for a couple of weeks and just kind of get the vibe. You say, Ray, you're crazy. I just tell, that's my list. I got a long list, all right, of things that I would love to do. So I can love life here. Those are great. I want to see my grandkids grow up. You know, I remember when the deal was if I could just see my boys grow up and get married, that I just life would be complete. You know what? That was good. 
but now I got grandkids. Now I got grandkids. So it's like, I want to see Cooper get married. I want to be, I was telling Jane last night, I wonder if we'll be grandparents in the background just kind of sitting and feasting in that. Or I wonder if I'll still be able to do a ceremony if they'll ask me to do the ceremony. I'm just wondering how that would be. We have all these cute little grandkids down. I can't wait to get to see them get married one day and have their kids. So I want to do these things in life and I want to love living. But I want to know that if my time comes, that it's okay. It's okay. When the old train comes for me, it's okay. Philippians 1.23 says this. This is the message, a great paraphrase. Hard choice. Hard choice. The desire to break camp here and be with Christ is powerful. Some days I can think of nothing better. You ever feel that way? Boy, to just leave here and go be with Christ, I just, some days, and some days I don't, some days it's like I, I want to do some stuff here, but some days I think that. One more scripture, 2 Corinthians 5, 1. For we know that when this earthly tent we live in is taken down, when we die and we leave these bodies, we will have a home in heaven, an eternal body made for us by God himself and not by human hands. I have some friends here who have some health concerns. Doug, largely because he was a swift boat on the swift boats in Vietnam. The, the things that we see wrong with Doug go all the way back to Vietnam. And his health is breaking down. He can't see in one eye. and He's going blind in his other eye. And he's got half his brain won't work. Or maybe Janet just made that up. But anyway, something like that. <laughs> something like that. But one day, his health will be perfect. My friend Billy had a stroke. And he's been deaf his whole life. Billy can't hear. Some people think he's stuck up. He's not stuck up. He can't hear. He's also an umpire, which is a great job for an umpire because people yell at him. He has no earthly idea. <laughs> he's, he goes home every day and he's had a wonderful day. And he doesn't know that they've been saying things. He doesn't know. But it's wonderful. But one day, perfect health. Santa Steve, one day, perfect health. Perfect health. Others of you in this place, perfect health. It's wonderful, the thought. You know what it makes you want to do? It makes you want to, because none of us get there because of us. We get there because of Christ. We get there because he lived and he died and he rose again. The song Darwin sang, you can't keep a good man down. He lived, died, rose again. You and I can go to heaven because of Christ. There's nothing better than that. Nothing better. And here's what I want to happen. In just a moment, I'm going to want you to bow your heads. And at the end of my prayer, I want you to have your card in your hand. And I'm going to give you three things I want you to think about. At the end of your card that you've already filled out, I want you to either put an A, B, or a C on there. Just capital A, capital B, capital C. A would be you saying, I have already received Christ. I know I'm a follower of Jesus. In other words, you're saying, I feel confident about where I'm going after this life. Or B, and listen, nothing is wrong with B. If you're honest and this is where you are, I, I, I love honesty when people say, you know what, I have not received Christ. And I'm not sure about where I'm going to go after this life. But you're just saying this is honest. Or you put a C. And C would be for those people in just a moment who would pray with me to receive Christ. Who would say humbly as, as you can I want to follow Jesus I really want to follow him I don't know what that means I don't know how good I'm gonna do in this whole thing I don't understand it all I just want to follow him because I believe he did come as a human and he did beat death and because he as a human in human form beat death now we can beat death now we can live this life and be prepared for a better life beyond this life so some of you are going to put a C. If you put a C, then I want you to be thinking about the idea that we're going to be doing a baptism in probably the end of June. We'll give you information about that because we'd like you to be baptized. That's a thing that you do as a testimony, but something you show people because you're being baptized. Hey, I prayed to follow Christ. It's the first thing you ask us to do. I prayed to follow him, and I'm willing to do this. But more than anything, I don't want anybody, I hope you didn't pick up fear because this was not about fear. 
It's about a confidence we can have, a quiet, humble confidence we can have that we love God and we follow Jesus. And because we're followers of Jesus, we can live this life excellently and we can prepare for the next life and know what he has prepared for us, we cannot even imagine. The Apostle Paul was given just a glimpse of heaven in a vision. The Bible says after he had that glimpse, he could not even speak for days. And when he finally did speak, he said this, eye has not seen, neither has ear heard, neither has it ever entered into man's fanciful imagination what God has prepared for those who love him. It's unbelievable. I'm going to ask you to bow your head as Darwin gets ready to sing a song because this is going to be a time when I want you to pray. Darwin's going to sing a song, and then I'm going to say another word, and we're going to be dismissed in just a moment. But I want you to pray. Father, right now, for those people here who are not sure where they would be, but they want to know, they want to believe in their hearts, they want to have confidence, not because of arrogance, not at all because of arrogance, but because they want to know. I pray today they'll make that decision. You said in your word, you said in your word that we can know that we have eternal life. To as many as received him, to them he gave the power to become sons and daughters of God. Father, I pray right now, men and women in this place would be saying, Lord, I want to follow you the best way I know how. And I pray during this song, with a heart focused on you, each one of us would put either an A, B, or a C, just like it's on the screen, an A, B, or a C, on what we're wanting to do today or declaring today. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Listen to this song.